want to encourage you this this morning. We today is the first Sunday of Advent, and um, Advent is about Jesus coming, about expecting Jesus coming. And I hope that I hope that some of you, when you came in to the sanctuary today, or when you looked at your bulletin today, you had some questions. So that's interesting. Anybody? Maybe you didn't even look at the front of your bulletin. Uh, but it's a picture of what we want to depict for you in this Advent season. And the, the mess up here is sort of a picture. And any of you say, what in the world is that? Okay, Doug noticed it and wondered, why is there a mess? It's just papers strewn. Because we want to talk this season about the mess of Christmas. And so many times when we, when we look into the Advent season, we, we look at the good things, which is Jesus coming is a good thing, right? But we miss the mess of what has happened to people's lives before Jesus came. And even after Jesus comes into our lives, we have these messes. Anybody else have a mess in your life that you're still dealing with? Amen. So I want to I want to I want to take us there uh, into the mess of Christmas. Before I do that, I want to remind you: if you have not uh, made a commitment to grace giving, you have your grace giving um, sheets in your bulletin again this week. This is our way of committing to giving you personally, giving to our mission agencies and missionary missionaries. And if you haven't filled that out, please do so and leave it in the offering plates. The offering plates are in the back, as they have been for quite some time, and we want to encourage you to leave your offering there. Uh, anytime during the service or after the service, but please fill out a uh, uh, a grace giving form to let us know what you plan to give next year to our mission agencies. I'm going to ask you to excuse me this morning. I, like many of you, have not missed the opportunity to experience a cold this season. I like to take every opportunity that's available, not for colds, <clears throat> and so I may... I may pause a few times, but um, back to the theme, the theme. When Jesus comes, and if we could put a subtitle on there, we could say, when Jesus comes into our mess. (laughs) And so uh, as we look forward to Christmas, as we look forward to Jesus coming, I want to take you into these common stories with maybe a little different bit of a focus when Jesus comes into our mess. In Luke chapter 1, we're going we're gonna to begin this morning in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And uh, I want you to turn there if you have a Bible or if you have your app. And if you could read along with me in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And we're going we're gonna to focus on several verses here. It says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Ab- Abijah. And he and his wife... From the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. He had a wife, sorry. And her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both advanced in years. Elizabeth found hope in her mess. And we're going to look at the mess in Elizabeth's life Um, Here's the reality about messes in our lives. Sometimes we make a mess. Somebody say amen. Sometimes we create a mess in our life by what we think or what we do or whatever. So, so sometimes the mess is created by us. Sometimes the mess comes from our family. Somebody say amen. Amen. Sometimes the, the, the family we grew up in or even our current family situation, the mess is, is part of the family system or the family situation. Sometimes other people make a mess for our life, right? So sometimes the mess comes from what other people do. And sometimes in the case of Elizabeth, the mess just is. It's just there. Uh, sometimes we're looking for all kinds of reasons for the mess in our lives, and, and it just is there. Remember when the disciples saw the man born blind, and they looked at Jesus, they said, Jesus, who caused this mess in his life, his parents or him? And what did Jesus say? Neither caused the mess in his life. This, this isn't something that was caused by people, but it was allowed so that God would be glorified. So sometimes the mess is that way, and that's Elizabeth's mess. Elizabeth's mess was that she was barren. Everybody say barren. 
So what do we know about Zacharias and Elizabeth? Well, the truth is we don't know much. We have these couple of verses, and that's really all we know about them. Uh, the story goes on, obviously, but, but as far as their background, just a couple of things. Number one, they both came from priestly lineage. They both were part of the priestly line of God's people. And so both Zacharias, who was serving as a priest, and Elizabeth came from priestly families. Secondly, very importantly here, it says that they both were righteous in verse 6, in the sight of God. They walked blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements. They were righteous. So they were from the priestly line. They were good people. They were righteous people. They did what they were supposed to do. And then thirdly, it says that they had no child. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren. I'm not going to overlook that that fact today. Elizabeth was barren. We're going to talk about that. The final thing that these passages, these couple of verses tell us is that they were both advanced in years. So here are priestly people, righteous before God, who have no children and they're old. That's what we know about Zacharias and Elizabeth. Let's talk about what barrenness would have meant in that day specifically. Now, some of you know people, maybe you've experienced this yourself, who have experienced the same thing in their life. They're unable to bear children. They're barren even today. We don't, we don't call it barrenness these days. But we, we call it infertile or whatever. But, but some of you may know some situations like that or you've experienced it yourself. But if we were to go back to Elizabeth's day and talk about it in that context, you would need to understand that in that day it was, it was a personal tragedy. In so many ways, we're going to look at the, the realities of barrenness in, in Elizabeth's life. That's why I, I say it's a mess. God is coming into a mess in Elizabeth's life. And, and, and specifically, we're focusing on Elizabeth because the Bible says Elizabeth was barren. One of the things we know today that when there's a couple and they can't have children, we understand today by science and by all the things that we know, it could be his problem, right? Right? But back in that day, there was not any thought about whether it could be his problem. It was, about, it was always about her. And so the, the weight of all of this reality is on Elizabeth. It's not on Zacharias. Nobody thinks maybe something's wrong with Zacharias. Nobody ever thought that in that day. It was always women who were the, who were the focus. And so this is really Elizabeth's mess. Now, Zacharias has a, a part in this because, uh, as we'll see later, many times husbands would put away their wives or basically get rid of them so that they could find a wife who would get a child for them. In that day, so it's partially Zacharias' mess, but it's Elizabeth's. This was this was directly related to God's command in Genesis that says, "Be fruitful and multiply." Clearly, uh, in that day, as opposed to today, in that day, people understood that marriage was for the purpose of of uh, being fruitful and multiplying, of of bearing children, so that the population would continue to grow. And so with that understanding, we go and we look at this mess that Elizabeth had in her life. So I have several things I want you to look at this morning. Number one, to be barren in in Elizabeth's day was to bear or to experience a stigma. A stigma. A stigma is uh, partially from yourself and, and mostly from others, which includes what? A stigma is what? It's a disgrace. It's an embarrassment. It's shame. Here's a priestly family. Here's, a, if you will, a pastoral family that, that is doing everything right. And yet, in, in this critical reality of their lives, they can't experience what, what people are supposed to experience. And, and, and it's a stigma. It's shame on their family. It's shame on, specifically, Elizabeth, again, because the, the blame is all on her in that, in that time frame. Here's a family that's supposed to be close to God, and yet they can't get what they want the most. You ever know somebody who's, who's, a, who's a leader or whatever and, and they, they experience physical uh, sickness or situation and they can't get healing? And it's that kind of thing. It's like they, of all people, that family, that person should experience what God would want. How can it possibly be? And also the part of the stigma in that day was, and if you read through scriptures, you find about barrenness. Barrenness many times or, or could come from a curse, directly from a curse. 
curses could bring barrenness into people's lives. Also, the, the Bible's clear, there's divine, God could punish people by, by closing up their womb, the Bible says. And so, uh, whether it's a curse or whether it's a divine judgment, you, you can imagine what the people around Elizabeth and even herself might wonder. Is God judging me for something? And the people around her, what has Elizabeth done wrong? Just like the disciples, God, what has Elizabeth done wrong that she can't bear children? And so the stigma is one of shame. The stigma is one of embarrassment. The stigma is one of Elizabeth perhaps being, being tempted to wonder day after day, am I a bad person? This morning in our worship time, Norm mentioned that, that, that he was thinking, well, you know, I, I shouldn't say anything. Or and maybe some of you in your worship, you were experiencing that. You're saying, you know, I've been a bad person this past week or whatever. And, and this stigma about barrenness is the same kind of thing. Maybe there's something wrong with me. And so Elizabeth is dealing with a stigma. And, and as the stigma grows, the longer the mess lasts... The stigma becomes your identity. Who I am is a failure. Who I am is a nobody. Who I am is not able to be who I'm supposed to be. So she has a stigma. The second one is the the barrenness relates to status. It relates to status. A status of a wife in, in this day would have been completely centered on whether or not she could provide children for her husband. It was that important. And you see this in uh, polygamous marriages in in the Bible where some of these these guys had multiple wives and one of them had children and the other couldn't. Or you see it in the situation where you remember Abraham and Sarah, pretty important people in the Bible, pretty important call of God. And God said, you're going to have a great uh, family and nations are going to come from you. and and, And Sarah couldn't provide children. Stigma, and, and, and she didn't have the status that goes along with bearing children. And so she gives her, her, um, her, what's her, her servant, Hagar, to Abraham. And Hagar, the Bible says, Hagar conceived. And then there was this uh, status that Hagar had that Sarah didn't have. So she despised it. Are you following me? So there's this status that goes along with the one who can can bear children. There's a source of striving for status. There's a story, uh, I believe it was Rachel and Leah, where, where uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's Jacob. Anyhow, there's a story of one of the wives who sold an, a night with her husband because she wanted to try to have a child with, well, I don't know, the, the, the mandrakes from her son. I don't know, you, y'all know what I'm talking about? There was a, and so, so it's this competition to have the status. I'm better than you because I've, had, I've given my husband more children. There's a status that's involved with it that Elizabeth doesn't have. She doesn't have the status of a good wife who is giving children to her husband. So along with that, the stigma and the status comes brokenness. Here's Elizabeth who has a mess in her life and she has this thought, I believe, I can't change this and it hurts. You ever have a mess like that in your life? I can't change this, but it hurts. It's brokenness. You can pray, you can continue to ask God and nothing is changing. As a matter of fact, Rachel, uh, when she was childless, the Bible says she prayed this prayer, give me children or I will die. It was that drastic of a reality. Give me children or I will die. Hannah, the Bible talks about her coming. And the Bible says she was weeping and not eating. She was desperate. And her rival, the, 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 the other wife who had children, was making fun of her. All of this. There is a brokenness that comes from this mess. And sometimes in your life, in my life, we have a mess that lasts so long that we just become broken because of it. And again, it becomes who we are. And then in all of this... In the, in, the, in the stigma and the status and the brokenness. In this account, we're going to see that, that you remember that Zechariah was, was, was serving as a priest <coughs> in the temple. And he has a vision from God. And God says, you're going to have a child. And then suddenly, suddenly, Elizabeth's mess has God come into it and she conceives a child. In a mess, there are these suddenlies, especially when Jesus comes, as we look at, as we talk about in our lives. And I, I know, I'm not saying that Jesus came into this circumstance. This was John 
But the point is, in messes, when Jesus comes, it can come and often comes suddenly after maybe, maybe years of prayer, after maybe years of brokenness, after maybe years of stigma of people around us. In a moment, everything changes. <clears throat> I want you to know today that if you are experiencing a mess in your life, how many of you, you I mean, you keep hearing me say a mess, and maybe that's not what you've ever referred to it as. But how many of you can acknowledge, you can think right now of a mess in your life, something that you need God to move or change and, and you haven't been able to see change? I mean, most of you can experience. So I'm, I want you to know today that, that when you have a mess, and some of you have had this mess for a long, long time, and some of you it's just recently, but you have a mess in your life and you need God. I want you to know that God will move suddenly if you will continue to believe that he will move. And when Jesus comes, it was suddenly. If you think about all of the, the history of God, and the story of God and, and the years and years and years and hundreds and thousands of years waiting for, the, waiting for the Savior. And then suddenly Jesus comes. There is a suddenly about messes. Suddenly the brokenness is gone. Suddenly the breakthrough comes. Suddenly the barrenness is no more. And it all changes. When Jesus comes, it's not like it was before. But, but, the before matters. The before matters. The mess matters. And here's what I want you to know about your mess. Here's what I want you to know about Elizabeth's mess. Here's what I want you to know about God coming suddenly into messes. The mess is the foundation for your testimony of what God can do. The mess is the foundation of a testimony of what God can do. Uh, several of you, quite a few of you were, were uh, down in Waynesboro yesterday with Philip and Kathy. And thank you for everyone who continues to pray and, and for those of you who, who were there to support them. Um, and, uh, and the testimony of Philip, how many of you would agree Philip and Kathy have a mess? <laughs> if, you, if you're not aware, if you're, your visitor, Philip, is, has been convicted uh, wrongly of a, of a crime of helping a homosexual woman and her child and, and all of those things. And, and they're in this mess. He's supposed to go to prison on Wednesday. This is what, where he's at in this process. And, and in, the, in the mess, if you were there yesterday and you heard Philip share, he said a couple of things when he began to share. He said, we're not heroes. We just did what every believer should do. We helped somebody in need. And then secondly, he said, one of the reasons we have hope, how many of you heard this? One of the reasons we have hope is because of all the miracles God has done in our life. How do they know it was miracles? Because God moved in a mess in their life. The mess, the, the struggle you're facing today, the struggle Elizabeth experienced was, was the foundation for the testimony. It's the foundation. It's the beginning of this whole story. If you look at the book of Luke, this is the beginning of the story of God unfolding when Jesus comes. And it's the first thing. And that is she was barren. Everybody say barren. She had a mess in her life. And because of that, it became the foundation of the story of the miracle of God. The mess is the foundation of the testimony of God. God coming suddenly in your life. Here's a question I want to ask for us today, because if you looked at the title of the message, the title of the message was about knowing yourself. And I'm going to come back to Elizabeth in just a little bit, but I want to talk about you and your mess that you're experiencing right now. And here's the thing. Sometimes when we have a struggle, sometimes when we have a difficult thing in our life, the truth is that we don't know what we're doing ourselves about it, and we are, we are exacerbating the mess in our life without even knowing it. Do you know what that means? That means that we're making it worse by how we're responding to the mess. And a critical point in that is, do you know yourself well enough to know what you might be doing in the mess that is keeping it from becoming something that God can move in? So I want to suggest to you this morning that there are things you can look at in your own life. And, and again, I'll come back to Elizabeth, but for you today, there are patterns, there are parents, there are priorities, there are previous experiences that are all trying to tell you something about your mess. And I want to, I want to ask several questions about facing yourself in your own life. Do you know yourself well enough to know how you're responding? And there are three specific things I want to challenge you today. Paul said in the Bible, Paul said that we're supposed to put off the old self, right? How many of you know what all is included in your old self? 
Well, I'm going to suggest to you today that not many of us have taken the time to sit down and quietly ask God, what, 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 all, what all is there? <laughs> what, what do I need to put off? If we're not careful, we get real spiritual about it and we say, well, God, just put off the old and give me the new. And we don't even know what old God wants to put off. Do you know yourself well enough to put off the old self? Augustine, one of the fathers of the faith from the, uh, I believe, the second, second century or third, uh, he, said, he said that you have to know yourself if you're going to know God. And so I want to suggest to you three traps that we face in our lives that keep us from experiencing the, uh, the fullness of what God wants to do in the mess. How many of you believe that God can use difficult cir circumstances and trials to teach you something about yourself? How many of you can have a, t you have a testimony of something you know today about yourself or something you know today about God that you wouldn't have known had you not gone through the trial that you experienced? And so the question is, in the mess, are we aware of these traps? Number one, one of the traps that we face in, in, in knowing ourselves is this trap, this, this lie, and that is, I am what I do. I am what I do. I am what I do. What I accomplish defines who I am. I am what I do. In Elizabeth's life, I, I mentioned this already, Elizabeth was a, a priestly line. She was of the best of the best of you, the, the ones who were the pastors, the, one who were the, the ones who were the leaders of the spiritual life of God's people. And yet she had no baby. She has these conflicting messages. You are priestly and you have no baby. There's this conflict going on. And so, if you will, in Elizabeth's life, to have a baby would be something she would do, right? And so, if Elizabeth is defined by what she does, she basically is a failure. You might have a different thing that you are supposed to do. Maybe yours isn't to have a baby. At least half or so of you, that's definitely the answer here today. But what are you tempted to define yourself by? Obviously, you could define yourself by your work. You could define yourself by your, the task. You could define yourself by your parenting. You could define yourself by your ministry. You could define yourself by all kinds of things that you can do. And if you're, if you're focused in your life, and by the way, this is commonly placed in our lives from our family of origins. You are what you do. One of the things that I have learned in my own life is that the only uh, positive affirmation that I ever received as a child, and that was just a few times, was because of something I did. When, when you live in a, in a family of origin that only affirms what you do, you take on the identity that what I do is what matters, and you, this becomes a, a core of what you believe. I am what I do. I don't know what it was like for you and your family, but families are meant to be a place of delight where just the fact that you are is delightful. I like to, I like to watch Jariah run around this building and... Uh, and, and uh, he, he comes in and, and he'll tell me on Sunday morning, he said, I turned on the lights. He likes to tell me he turned the lights on and, and uh, let me know that, that, uh, that he's helping take care of things. I, I delight in Jariah. He's a joy to be around. Would you agree with that? He's like, what are you people looking at me for? <laughs> Jariah's not in my family, but... I could go through Caleb and Kara and Ellie and Evan, who's not here today, and I could talk about, about the, the, just who they are and what a delight that is. I'm not saying that I have changed the pattern. To be honest, I have been tempted to affirm what my kids do. How many of you could say that's probably a pattern that most of us have had? We, we see what they do. We affirm, oh, you did a great job. Look at what you did. You did a great job instead of affirming just who they are. You are a lovely person. I like being with you. I'll never forget the moment when Evan looked at me not that long ago across the table and he said, Dad, I like you. That is delight. Just in, he just likes me. That's the kind of thing we're supposed to receive from our families, but most of us receive the message, you are what you do. And if we're not careful, we're still living out of that. Number two, the second trap is, I am what I have. I am what I have. 
we can pretty quickly see how that applies to our life. In Elizabeth's life, she had no children, which makes her what? Nothing. If I am what I have and I don't have, then I'm nothing or I'm less than other people. I, I have less value because I don't have. You could, you could go down the list of, of things that we, we put our value in. I have a beautiful wife. I have wonderful children. I have lots of money. I have things. I have, have, have. And they can become something that we put our trust in. I have all of these things. And that becomes a measure of value of people. And if you are measuring yourself by that value, let me tell you that when you have things, you'll feel good about yourself. But when you lose things or when you see somebody that has more things than you, you will find yourself devalued. And we, we, we fall into that trap too often. Number three, number three trap that we, that we, the false reality of self is that I am what others think. I am what others think. Other people define us. What other people think about me is what's most important. Elizabeth, remember I said in Elizabeth's life, I don't, I don't doubt for a moment that she heard it, she felt it, and it was real around her that people were looking and talking behind her back about what must be wrong with her. And so what other people think could have been the thing that just weighed her down. Just Wednesday evening at our small group meeting, <clears throat> we sort of were dealing with this, and um, Tamitha's not here, but she said, she said she has a philosophy of so what? And, and she said, when, when people think things about me, I say, so what? And she said, she's not in a, not in a, a, a bad way. I mean, you can, you can care so little about what people think that you never receive input from people. But, but if your first response is to become depressed because someone sees something in you or someone criticizes you or whatever, you're going you're gonna to be weighed down. How many of you know that there are plenty of people that have bad thoughts about you? It's not that hard to find people that have negative thoughts about you. And if you are what others think, you're going to begin to live in that. But we need to develop the truth as opposed to uh, this false, this trap. If you are living that way, you constantly live in fear. You constantly compare. You react when somebody says, you know, even the slightest bit of criticism becomes something that just destroys you. You say, oh, well, well am I? And you live in fear of what other people think. But these are false traps that you and I can fall into. And if you don't know, this is what I want you to see today. If you don't know that you're operating in one, two, or three of those, and by the way, most of us are operating in all of these at some level or another. This is just the reality of living in the flesh, the natural reality of who we are. Because from the day you were born, you were things were being placed into your life, reality is realities were being placed into your life that are causing you to think in a certain way. And most, I would say all of us at some level is dealing with one of these traps or all of them. So let's get back to Elizabeth. And I want to help sort of tie these things together. So Elizabeth, Elizabeth in this story, when she conceives, she experiences true hope and the suddenly. I want to reread this, this passage, if you, if you would bear with me today. And I'm going to read just a little bit farther this time. And beginning again in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And again, if you have your Bibles, I'd love it if you would follow along and read with me. So it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Verse 8. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. 
And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. Verse 11. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Listen, Elizabeth's cry of her heart was, give me a son, not give me the forerunner to the Messiah. She wasn't praying this specific prayer, I don't believe. I don't think Zechariah and Elizabeth were saying, God, we want the forerunner of the Messiah who's going to be great, who's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb, who's going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. I don't think that was their prayer. Their prayer was simply, give us children. And so what I want you to see is that in this mess that Elizabeth was experiencing, she has this suddenly that brings incredible hope. This is far beyond anything I could have ever prayed for. That's the way God will move in our lives if we'll continue to expect and pray and believe. Remember, look at it says here. It says, your petition has been heard. That means Zacharias and Elizabeth had been praying and asking God for a son or for a child. More likely, they were asking for a son because in that day, it was so critical for the name to be passed on, for the family line to be passed on. And so in their prayer, the Bible says, the angel said, your petition has been heard. But here's what I want you to see. As I did some research on barrenness in the Bible, because that is Elizabeth's mess. Barrenness in the Bible, the stories are plenty. But in every other story of barrenness, included in the story is the desperation and the infighting that is a part of the barrenness. I mentioned a few of them earlier today when I talked about uh, Abraham and Sarah. Sarah gave her servant and the servant conceived. And then there was this fighting, uh, Rachel and Leah. And you see this, this, this competition. Uh, Hannah was being made fun of by her, her rival. There's this desperation. There's this struggling. And in this case, none of that is mentioned. That's what I, I think stands out. I don't know that there was no desperation. It doesn't say that. But here's the way the story reads. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. It doesn't mention desperation and struggle. And here's what I think that can say to us. Listen, I'm not saying that, the, the, you know, I'm not, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm basically reading what's not there and saying, is it possible that Elizabeth knew herself well enough to not fall into the traps and to just continue to trust God in the mess? Is it possible to live in a, in a struggle, in a trial and not fall into the traps? that say, I am nothing because of this mess. I am a failure because of this mess. Some of you in your life, your children were really small and you had this dream for their life and you had this dream for your life. You say, I'm going to be a perfect parent. How many of you set out to be perfect parents? I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to raise these children and they're going to be awesome children for God. And, and of course, that's a great vision to, to raise children that way. You're not going to be perfect, so if you're young and you're getting ready to have children, don't set that as your goal. But how many of you know that children have a way of thinking for themselves? Huh? You know, it's like, it's like that phrase we say, well, he's got a mind of his own. Good. <laughs> That's kind of necessary. But you set out... And then things turned and your children today aren't what you had set out for them to be. And it's a mess. For some of you, it's a mess. And if you fall into the traps of I am what I do, 
you will begin to believe the lies of what other people might think about you, that you are a failure. Did you do some things wrong? Well, you, you need to acknowledge that. I have done plenty wrong in my parenting. But I don't think Elizabeth fell into the traps. I think she was able to know herself well enough to stop herself when the traps came so that she lived in a place. You can live in a place of peace even in the worst mess of your life. Would you, would you hear that word today? You can have hope in the worst mess of your life. The question is, do you know yourself well enough to stop the traps from taking over in your life? Elizabeth and Zacharias seem to have hoped in God all along and have been able to overcome the false self. Elizabeth seems to have been hopeful and waiting and trusting, and she was filled with hope. And when the conception happens, she's literally filled with physical life, hope and life that comes into herself. So do you know yourself? Here's the truth about you. I want you to take this truth with you today. I want you to begin to look and say, am I falling into these traps or can I live in the truth about myself? So the first lie or the first trap that we talked about is I am what I do. But the truth about you as a, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus is, is that you are what he has done. Jesus. You are what he has done. Secondly, the, the lie is I am what I have. You are what he gave. And thirdly, the lie is, I am what others think. You are what he thinks. It, we could say it, to personalize it, we could say it this way. I am what he has done. What has he done? What has Jesus done? What has he accomplished on your behalf? Everything you need. You say, well, everything I need. I mean, Jesus didn't provide for a job well, every, the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. Every grace you've experienced in your life comes from Him. But what you need, what you need ultimately was salvation and reconciliation to God. And Jesus did it. You are what He has done. Would you say that with me? I am what He has done. Would you say it again? I am what He has done. Second thing, the second truth is I am what He gave, not what I have. Again, what did Jesus give? He gave you eternal life. He gave you salvation. He gave you a ministry. Of, he gave you reconciliation with God. He gave you righteousness. It's what you need. Some of you have been with us a long time. You've heard me say this, but years ago, um, Evan, who's very, very smart, he's my oldest, and actually all my kids are extremely intelligent, I should say that, as well as my wife, um, and, so, and I am actually. Uh, <coughs> you laughed at only the last one. And so Evan, when he was young, and I would say, uh, you know, whatever the situation we were in, I said, well, what's the worst that could happen, you know? What's the worst that could happen? Of course, you know that phrase, the worst that could happen is, you know, if we were going to you know, have Sunday morning service and the guitar string broke or whatever. He said, no, actually, the worst that could happen is we could die and go to hell. That's actually true, isn't it? I mean, so when somebody said, what's the worst that could happen? The worst that could happen is we could die and go to hell. So anything better than that is good. But here's the good thing. Jesus gave you salvation so that that never needs to happen in your life. That's who you are. He gave you eternity with God. And the, So let's say that together. I am what he gave. Say it with me. I am what he gave. The third one is I am what he thinks. And maybe this is maybe the, the easiest one to grasp and to grab hold of and begin to meditate on. I am what he thinks or what he says that I am. I am what he says. What has he said about you? Do you know what he said? He said, 
He said, I delight over you. He said, I, I loved you enough to send my son. He said, he said, I have created you for good purposes. He said, I'm going to work in you and through you. He, he said so many things about you. That's what he thinks about you. And that's who you are. Now, I know that sitting here today, uh, we, can, we can look at that and say, yes, yes, that's what he says about me. But see, this comes back to knowing this and beginning to look at myself and say, am I living in that truth? This is about knowing yourself. Do you live in that truth or do you live in the other truth that says, I am what other people think about me? How much do you operate in what other people think about you? Here's, here's how all of this um, sort of... Sort of um, becomes real in your life. How do you get to know yourself? And we have four things. You can write these down if you want to, but these are four things you can do to get to know yourself. Number one, look inside. I like to say introspect silently. Y'all have heard me talk about silence a lot lately, but knowing yourself takes the intentional time of sitting down and getting quiet and evaluating. One of the things that I like to do, I don't do it as much as I need to, but I like to do is at the end of the day, review the day. You say, God, how was my day? And we think about, you could ask these three, how often did I operate out of the traps versus the truth? Well, there's, a, there's that one time when uh, I got an email <laughs> and somebody was not so graciously reminding me of my failures, you know, in this or that. And, and I begin to just get depressed because of that. What is that? That's, I am what other people think. If you don't stop and, so number one is quiet introspection. You have to look at yourself. By the way, it, that, that's very uncommon. It's very uncommon for, for us to stop and look at ourselves, not in a critical way, in a realistic way to say, how am I operating? The other day, uh, Robert McFarlane was meeting with me. He's, he's coaching me on, on thinking further ahead and, and thinking about the future for the church and thinking about setting sort of a vision of where we're going. And, and uh, I said to him up front, I, I don't like to do that. I don't like to think down the road a, a bunch of years. Maybe some of you, that's, that's all you do is think down the road. But I don't, I don't like to spend time. I just discovered recently I don't like to do that. He said to me a critical question. He said, why do you think you don't like to do that? You see, that's, a, that's an important point because that becomes introspective. See, it's one thing to know you don't like it. It's another, it's another thing to know why don't you like it. What is it about that that causes you to not like it? And so we sat there, and I, and I said what, what normally you end up saying with people who coach you. The first thing you say is, that's a really good question. <laughs> you know, you know when, you're, when you're talking to somebody and you ask them something and they pause and they go, that's a good question. You know you've, you've, you actually have asked a good question. So I sat and I thought about it for a little bit, and I began to describe for him some of the things from my life and some of the fears that have been a part of my life. And essentially it was this. I'm afraid to set goals down the road because I'm sure I will fail at meeting them. And that will make me even more sure that I'm a failure. That's introspection. That's being willing to look at yourself and say, why am I motivated or not motivated this way? I was in a meeting not that long ago. It's been a while ago, but I was in a meeting with somebody who is is a mature person, and I'm going to put that in quotes, a mature person in the church. And I said to that person, I said, why do you think you reacted that way? And I had to ask it three or four times, and the, and the mature person in the church was not able to actually introspect and think, this is what is the cause of that. I'm going to suggest to you today that's not a mature person. A mature person in the faith or a mature person in life is somebody who is able to look at their own life and say, I might have these issues. I have these things. I am falling into one of these traps. 
Are you following me? So number one is, is quiet introspection. Number two, you need to have trusted companions. And I'm going to do these quickly. Trusted companions are the people who you trust to see your life and speak into your life. I'm going to tell you one of the greatest problems we have in the church today is that we're unwilling to be honest with each other. If you've been a part of the small groups, you know that one of the things we're doing is trying to establish a groundwork for authentic relationships. And authentic relationships don't try to keep the peace just so that nobody gets upset. They're willing to look at each other and say, this is what I see in your life. Trusted companions. So you need to reach out to people. See, you don't just wait for this to come to you. You intentionally say, I need you to tell me what you see. Number three. You need to move from your comfort zone. And that means if you're afraid, for example, I just gave you that example. If you're afraid of going into the future, if you're afraid of that, you move from your comfort zone and you say, in spite of my living in the trap of the past, I'm going to trust in the truth of who God said I am. And I'm going to trust that he's going to speak and I'm going to trust that he's going to do it. And it won't matter if I don't get there because that's not what I'm defined by. And that moves out of your comfort zone into a place where you have had fear and you say, I'm going to trust. God in that. You want to you want to you want to grow in knowing yourself. You begin to move into things that don't feel comfortable. Number 4, you pray for courage. It takes courage. It takes courage. It takes courage to introspect and begin to change your life. Too many of us are experts at extrospecting. See, I make up words here if you don't. Extrospecting. So, you know, uh, you know, Linda says something to me that, that, that makes me mad, hypothetically. <laughs> and my first thought is, what's wrong with her? That's extrospection. I can start to say, well, she, she knows she shouldn't do this and she shouldn't do that and she should submit. Thank you, Harry. Or whatever. But, but, but when, when, in a, when I'm reacting, if my first response, if my only response is to look at what's wrong with you, I'm expert at extrospection and a, a total failure at introspection. See, here's a better question to ask. Try this out the next time you get offended. Maybe you're offended today. Maybe you don't like what I said today. Here's the best first question to ask. Huh, I wonder why I reacted that way. Would that change your life, your marriage, your relationship with your kids, your relationship with your boss? If the first question you asked was, huh, why would I react that way? How many of you can see that that's a different way of looking at life? And this is what gets us free from the traps of the past so we can move into the truth of what God has said. And this is why I say you have to know yourself to know God. And this is why I say in some form, when you look at the lack of desperation, when you look at the lack of struggle, when you look at the lack of those things in Zacharias and Elizabeth, I would suggest to you that they knew themselves so that they could know God. And you can know yourself so that you can know God. I'm looking forward to the responses to the message today. And I will promise you the first thing I'll ask myself is, huh, why would I react that way to those responses? If, if before you respond to me, you will ask yourself that question. Actually, it's not, it's not dependent on what you do. I have to ask that question every time. So here are a couple of things I want you to take home with you today. Three things that we focus on and we want to do at River Oaks Church is to live, connect, and engage. How can you take this truth and make it a part of living? See, a part of key to living is, to, is maturity and character. One of the things we don't do well is help, help the church develop maturity and character. We have many people who are in the church who have, who have been baby Christians for years and years and years and years. And we need to get beyond that and become mature. So how do you, how do you embrace this in, in the concept of living? You need to be willing to look at your mess, first of all. 
I don't have time to go into this today, but the common response to difficult, painful situations for many people is to find a distraction and focus on that. You want to live with maturity, go into your mess instead of getting away from your mess. I'm telling you, it takes courage and it's very hard because when you go into your mess, you're going to start to find things that hurt. You're going to start to find painful things. And how many of you like the feeling of pain? Not many. If you do, I'd like to see you after the service and pray deliverance over your life. We don't like pain. You don't go after pain, but you have to face pain if you're going to get beyond that in your life. So first of all, look at your mess. Be willing to focus on it. And in your mess, say, what is my part in this? Again, why do I react the way I do? Number two, I want to connect. How do you connect is about authentic relationships. We want, to, we want to help you connect authentically. So how would you apply this to connection? You need to be a person that operates in a, in a mentality that the person you're talking to is a person. Oh, that's a strange thing. Uh, of course they're a person. Really, is that how you're treating them? Or are they an objective? Are they someone who helps you get something done? And so it looks like this. If you will listen to and enter into someone else's mess, you begin to live authentically. Sometimes, many times, the reality is, if I start listening to you and I start hearing about your mess, my reaction, huh, why did I react that way? My reaction is a revelation that I have the same kind of mess in my life. So connecting authentically means being willing to hear your mess and engage in it with you because it can be just as painful to enter into your mess as it is to deal with mine. So be willing to listen and enter into someone else's mess. You might start this way. Hey, friend, tell me about your mess. No, probably that won't, won't work very well. But the, he or she is a person. He's a valuable person. He, his, who they are is what God thinks about them. I need to take the time to listen and enter in. And finally, how does it look, what does it look like to engage? Engage purposefully. Live our lives on purpose. Live your daily life on purpose. How many of you know that many people don't live their life on purpose? They live their life on cruise control. But when you live your life on purpose, you're looking for ways to engage in people's lives so that the kingdom of God will come. Your kingdom come, your will be done in this person's life as it is in heaven. And so <clears throat> the purpose of every believer's life is you're blessed to be, to, you are blessed to bless others. So when God blesses you, Purposefully, how can I bless somebody in the coming week, in the coming day, in the coming season of my life? So here's my challenge to you. Choose one act of grace for others who need hope. An act of grace is beyond what just naturally fits in my schedule and my time frame and my finances. Can I go back to Philip and Kathy? When Philip got a phone call that somebody needed help, it was not convenient for him to get involved at all. And yet, as an act of grace, because he had experienced grace in his life, he helped a person in need. An act of grace is going beyond what you can just fit into your schedule and it's saying, God, here's a person who has a need. One way that you, maybe many of you have done this already, and uh, is you, you, took an apple tree name, is it apple tree? And, and, you, and you bought a gift and you brought them here and you're, you're helping a child of, a, of an incarcerated person by giving them a gift. And, and you, you went outside of your normal for that. That's actually kind of an easy <laughs> act of grace, but it's still an act of grace. It's still on purpose. It's still saying, I want to be engaged in somebody's life. So you can live, you can connect, you can engage as you know yourself. Elizabeth, so saw God come into her mess and she was filled with life and hope. You can see God come into your mess and be filled with life and hope. The question is, along the way, are you willing to introspect and say, where am I at in this mess? Would you stand for prayer this morning?
Let's just go to God again. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Zacharias and Elizabeth. I thank you for John the Baptist. I thank you for the reality of the difficulty that Zacharias and Elizabeth were experiencing and how you miraculously invade a mess and your presence comes and everything changes suddenly. God, I pray that over the messes that are experienced here today. Christmas is wonderful. Jesus coming is the most important thing that we could ever ask for and believe for and hope for and, 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 we're, and be grateful for. And yet, if we're not careful, we miss the mess that Jesus came for. For every mess that is represented here today, I ask you, God, for grace. That we would be able to look at ourselves in the mess How am I reacting? Am I reacting by the traps or by the truth? That we would ask people to join us in looking at how we're reacting, the traps or the truth. Oh God, I just declare you're greater than every every struggle, every mess. You're greater. I just declare you're greater than our struggles. I declare God today that we are what Jesus has done what Jesus has given, and what you think of us. Would you empower us by your spirit to live out of that truth? So in the name of Jesus, I bless you, church, with truth that overcomes traps. I bless you with with an introspective gifting (laughs) to begin to be much more thoughtful about yourself. Why am I reacting? I bless you with the Holy Spirit that would bring insight into your current situation, into your past situations, into your family of origin, and and a willingness to go honestly into those areas so that we together can grow up into who God intended us to be. God Truth overcomes traps, and I declare that over the church today in Jesus' name. Let us live in your truth and live in your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a, have a great week with God and with your families, introspecting, um, believing that God wants to show you new things about yourself. Prayer team is going to come to the front, and if you have a specific thing you'd like to pray for, please come quickly so that they can pray with you and be a part of that as well. But God bless you and have a wonderful week.